Hi, and thank you for joining us. I'm Candice Rondeau, and I'm the, the director of the Future Frontlines program at New America. I'm thrilled to be here uh, with you all for this conversation with Peter Bergen about his new book, The Rise and Fall of uh, Osama Bin Laden. Although Peter really doesn't need much introduction, it's worth noting that he's one of the most accomplished journalists I have ever known. And in addition to being one of the most authoritative voices on the evolution of Al Qaeda and the rise and fall of Osama bin Laden, Peter is New America's Vice President for Global Studies and Fellows, and he is the head of our international security program. He is a longtime CNN analyst who has reported from the front lines of America's longest wars in the Middle East. And Peter is a prolific writer uh, who has authored and edited nine books and his chronicles of America's national security challenges have thrice landed him on the New York Times best bestseller list. It's worth also noting that Peter's book uh, was reviewed today in the New York Times um, by no less than Louise Richardson, uh, a big fan. I'm a big fan of hers. Uh, she is one of the most preeminent scholars on terrorism. So if you haven't had a chance, do check out the review and do check out the book. Um, we need to give a shout out and thanks to New America's International Security Program and all the members of New America's team, um, as well as our partners at Solid State Books for organizing this event. Um, you can purchase your copy of The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden through the link in the chat. Um, and during the event, we really want to invite you to converse with us, talk with us, uh, submit your questions in the Q&A, uh, and you, you can check that out in the feature below. You can find that at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can enter your questions there, and we'll get to your questions uh, toward the end of our conversation. So before um, I get into this conversation with Peter, I just want to say, you know, the publication of Peter's latest book, um, The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden, falls not coincidentally, just one month before the 20th anniversary of Al Qaeda's attacks on the World Trade Center in New York and the Pentagon in Washington, DC on September 11th, 2001. In fact, it was probably right around this time that um, Bush, the Bush administration's national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, would have been receiving a number of um, intelligence warnings about an imminent attack planned by Al Qaeda, although there were not many specifics on off offer at the time. Um, it also happens that only a few years before the attacks of 9-11, Peter snagged um, famously uh, an on-camera interview with Osama bin Laden that marked the beginning of Peter's um, great um, association with trying to understand this movement and uh, bin Laden as a man, um, but also I think sparked one of the greatest manhunts of all time, which Peter has also chronicled uh, both in books and in documentary form for HBO and others. Um, so what's really interesting to me about Peter's story, and I've known him for a long time now, uh, since our days back in the back in the wilds of Afghanistan um, before um, the latest chapter of the war. Um, I think what's really interesting about this book, Peter, is um, how you document how bin Laden rose to power um, and, and sort of left the world in this kind of ignoble state uh, in, in Pakistan. Um, and I think we're gonna look for, forward to hearing from you a little bit about kind of how you put this narrative together um, and some of your impressions um, before we also get to the audience Q&A. So there are a lot of myths, of course, about bin Laden. Uh, and I think you, you've talked about those myths in this book and I think you've done a really great job of unpacking them. Um, and recently you had a piece in the Washington Post that um, you know, enumerated five major myths about bin Laden and about Al Qaeda um, and kind of you know, what we know or what we think we know about him. Can you talk a little bit about those myths and, and what you, you kind of tease out there? Well, Candice, first of all, thanks for doing this. And Candice and I share not only an affiliation with New America, but we're also both professors at Arizona State University. <clears throat> and um, well, you know, uh, there have been a lot of myths about Bin Laden, and not surprising. Um, any kind of figure that actually, and bin, one, one of the interesting things about Bin Laden, he's one of the few people I think you can truly say that changed the course of history. I mean, without 9-11, a lot, a lot of events wouldn't have happened. Uh, the Iraq war wouldn't have happened. The overthrow of the Taliban wouldn't have happened. Uh, you know, so without, without, without Bin Laden, 9-11, uh, you know, it's really his idea. He pushed it. There was internal resistance within, within even Al Qaeda to this idea of attacking the United States. But you know, some of the myths, uh, you know, one big myth that kind of began early, uh, uh, 
on was uh, the idea that bin Laden was sort of a blowhard who didn't really fight on the front lines of the war. Um, Milt Bearden, uh, who's somebody I admire quite a lot, um, ran the CIA operation in Afghanistan. He told PBS frontline uh, that bin Laden essentially had never fought uh, in the war. Turkey Al Faisal, who ran Saudi intelligence uh, during the period of the Afghan war, uh, made similar observations in a interview, a relatively recent interview with the Guardian. The fact is, is that bin Laden actually fought whatever, you know, he's a complex figure uh, and clearly he did a lot of evil. But uh, one thing that he did do was fight uh, personally on the front lines against the Soviets or in almost suicidal bravery in 1987. Uh, that was documented in a couple of books in Arabic, uh, <clears throat> one of which uh, is actually probably the most useful account of that early experience, um, it was written by a guy called Abdul Badaji. Uh, it's, it's a pseudonym. Um, uh, anyway, so I, it was written by Abdul Badaji, um, and it was written in '91. It's a very detailed account of the Afghan Arabs, what they did in Afghanistan. Uh, it takes them to task occasionally, so it's not hagiographic, and it was. It's a very useful primary document because it was based on uh, interviews of people who actually kind of participated. Uh, in that um, jihad, and even uh, you know, had access to walkie-talkie transcripts and sort of from the battlefield. So that was that was that was one myth. I think that um, that I hope the book uh, you know at least sort of shows um, it was not the case. Another myth was the idea that the which is kind of relevant to today. And um, Candice, you're you know many of the players in 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 on both sides of this debate. Um, is the idea that Al Qaeda and the Taliban would separate after 9-11. Now, if you were a rational actor uh, after 9-11, if you were in the Taliban, I think there was a moment, we know there was a moment when I think peace could have been made with the Taliban. They had lost completely on the battlefield. They were interested in making some kind of peace. Uh, Anand Gopal, who's our colleague both at New America and at Arizona State has uh, detailed this in some, in, you know, uh, with, with kind of deep reporting. They were ready to make a deal in the sort of 2002 time period um, the deal, but the, the Americans were not interested uh, in, in such a deal at the time. The Taliban was sort of anathema. Um, so from a rational actor perspective, the Taliban would have rejected Al-Qaeda after 9-11. After all, bin Laden, who was not popular at that, up amongst many leaders of the Taliban, but you know, Mullah Omar was always his sort of rabbi, as it were. Um, we have the situation where uh, the, the Taliban leadership didn't particularly like bin Laden after 9-11. Um, you would have thought that they would have sort of, as a result of losing their, their regime power, that they would have rejected Al-Qaeda. But uh, that didn't happen. And in fact, in the Abbottabad documents, which are publicly available, so this, you know, anybody who's interested can, can look at these documents, you know, bin Laden was in correspondence with Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban. In the, uh, in the months before he died, essentially saying, you know, the Americans are leaving Afghanistan. It was kind of a sort of buck. He was trying to sort of essentially raise, raise the spirits of Mullah Omar. Other members of Al Qaeda were in, in touch with a, a guy called uh, 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 Tayyip Aga, who was uh, Mullah Omar's sort of initially private secretary, then became the lead negotiator with the Talib, uh, Taliban and, the, and, and, and in, in its discussions with the United States. Uh, there's also evidence in the Abbottabad documents that. Um, uh, Al-Qaeda was financing elements of the Taliban, including the Akhani network, uh, which of course, Siraj Akhani is now the number two leader in the Taliban. And uh, they're very, they're, they celebrated an attack on Bagram Air Force Base. It was a joint operation between the Haqqani network and, and Al-Qaeda that took place in, in, in mid 2010, um, and you know, in which an American contractor was killed and a dozen US soldiers were wounded. So the, the documents in about are pretty clear that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda continued warm relations. Uh, they did not separate. Um, and uh, the United Nations in June, as, as Candace knows, released a report um, which said that the relations between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban remain very close. And we don't think of the United Nations as a, as a I mean, I think of the United Nations as a pretty good independent uh, adjudicator of these issues. Uh, they've had a a cell there uh, looking at the Taliban and Al-Qaeda uh, for many years. Um, and, and they issue quarterly reports, which are, I think, pretty authoritative about what's going on. Um, and I think this UN report speaks for itself. 
I think it certainly does. I mean, so a couple of uh, interesting touch points here. I just want to mention for the geeks out there uh, who who have followed Al Qaeda uh, and Taliban um, and their and the rise uh, and fall, and then rise again at least of the Taliban. Um, famously, the Battle of Jaji, which you mentioned, uh, Peter, uh, where Bin Laden kind of cut his teeth uh, as a as a war fighter in the Soviet era. Um, also is the subject of a Russian film uh, that is actually um, for, again, for geeks out there uh, who care about these things, um, is probably one of the best films. Uh, it's a fictionalized film about Afghanistan and kind of the demoralizing um, encounter that the Soviets had in their, in their final years um, before their pullout. Uh, a, a movie that I always love. And another touch point, uh, Tayyip Aga, of course, uh, there was a lot of controversy uh, about even beginning to have a conversation with him because um, it was not clear whether he had the authority to speak on behalf of the Taliban at the time. Uh, and I remember those conversations very well internally with you know colleagues uh, at the State Department as well as you know other places around the world where uh, there was a lot of engagement on the negotiation process. Um, but of course, he did emerge uh, as a very important conduit. So interesting that you were able to bring out in the book that he, you know, he had these tight connections with Bin Laden all along, um, and whether or not, uh, you know, those who were responsible for negotiating on behalf of the United States fully understood that. I don't know if that's actually clear, um, at least from my interaction. So I think that's really an interesting um, bit that you brought out in your research. But another thing that you, I think you do so well in the book that um, I think is new um, is you, know, you kind of talk about, um, you know, Bin Laden as the man and you, you get this kind of interior look at his mindset, his thinking, um, and also his relationships with his family. Um, how, did you how did you do that? How did you reconstruct all that? Well, the about about documents are sort of a gold mine. I mean, the real gold mine, uh, the, the most useful document for that part of the story is the CIA released in late 2017 uh, at the behest of the Trump administration, uh, all the documents, as you know, kind of 470,000 files. Many of those files are, are not useful. Uh, you know, Bin Laden was uh, getting a lot of uh, reading materials on thumb drives, newspapers, he, his kids were watching cartoons, there's a whole, whole raft of stuff that isn't that, that useful. Uh, but there are about 6,000 pages uh, of useful material. Um, Nelly LaHood, who's a New America fellow, is going to write the, the definitive book about, about the subject, which I think will come out in spring of 2022, and I think will be uh, a fascinating deep dive into those documents. But the key, the, one of the key documents was what the CIA referred to as the Bin, Bin Laden's journal. It's actually something a little bit different and uh, even more interesting, I think, which is it was a Bin Laden family journal. Um, the Bin Laden family, as they were living in the about about compound in Pakistan, A, they had quite a lot of time on their hands, uh, and B, they, they knew that in Bin Laden's words, he wrote a top deputy, um, the Arab Spring events were the most momentous events in the Middle East in centuries. This was Bin Laden's view, um, but he was keenly aware that his, you know, his picture, his ideas, his followers were just simply not involved in the first months of these of these revolutions, whether in Tunisia or in Libya or in Egypt. And he was perplexed about what to do with it. And he and he was very excited that on February fifteenth, two thousand eleven. Um Hamza, who is his oldest wife, eight years older than him, age 62, suddenly reappeared in his life. She had been living in Iran under house arrest for about a decade. Uh, and Bin Laden, uh, and this may be surprising for people who aren't following the Al-Qaeda Bin Laden story closely, bin, two, of bin Laden's, two of Bin Laden's oldest wives had PhDs, were highly educated. Both of them claimed descent from the Prophet Muhammad, which was very important to Bin Laden, who put great store in trying to imitate in his own mind the life of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad. Um, and he really wanted them to kind of give him advice about what to say, because the Arab Spring was happening without his ideas, without his followers. And yet he knew this was really a big deal. I mean, what was Bin Laden trying to achieve? He was trying to achieve regime change in the Middle East and you know, install Taliban style theocracies from Morocco to Indonesia. Here was the regime change he hoped for, but it was being led by liberals and members of the Muslim Brotherhood, which he despised or disliked because of its uh, it, you know, engagement in conventional politics. So the, the diary is an almost daily account of these meetings that Bin Laden hosted every 
every night and is about a bad compound. And I, I want to thank Nadia Awedat, who's a New America fellow, who helped me kind of interpret what the, it's 228 pages of handwritten Arabic. So it's not easy to translate. Um, and, and of course, it's sort of written in a little bit of shorthand because it wasn't intended for public consumption. The family wanted to record what bin Laden was thinking about the Arab Spring. They wanted to advise him about a big speech that he was planning to deliver because he was conscious of two things. One, the Arab Spring was a big deal and he needed to intervene publicly. And two, the 10th anniversary of 9-11 was approaching and he wanted to make a big statement. Um, and I think his silence over the Arab Spring is pretty deafening. Uh, you know, because Bin Laden released a lot of videotapes and audio tapes in the period after 9-11, many of them, by the way, recorded in the Abbottabad compound. Uh, and in fact, we have outtakes of those uh, videos that are now publicly available. Um, and, uh, you know, so he, but he hesitated because he was trying to work out with his two older wives um, who were advising him and who played a kind of um, unseen but very important role in his thinking about what to say. And he came up with one big idea, two big ideas, I think. One was that he was going to kind of suggest that a religious, a religious council should be assembled and they would advise the new rulers of the Middle East about what to do. Presumably, their advice would be, you know, essentially rule like the Taliban, which no one in the Middle East was really clamoring for at the time. Um, and the other big idea he had, he was interested in issuing some kind of public apology on behalf of Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, because he was keenly aware, as were many of the people in, in the top leadership of Al-Qaeda, that Al-Qaeda's brand was in deep trouble because they were killing so many Muslim civilians. This was a group that had positioned itself as the defender of Muslim civilians, and yet so many of their victims in Iraq and Pakistan and elsewhere were Muslim civilians. And uh, the, the Badabad documents are full of kind of admonitions to the Pakistani Taliban, to Al-Qaeda in Iraq, to the Al-Shabaab in Somalia, which is basically stop killing Muslim civilians. So this was an, a, Bin Laden was wanted to kind of relaunch Al-Qaeda as kind of a kinder, gentler Al-Qaeda around the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And he was going to relaunch it with a public apology. So these were the kind of two key things that were on his mind that you, that you glean from the family diary and also from the other documents that were released uh, from the Abbottabad compound. So, I mean, really interesting that you have this kind of I alone can fix it um, kind of mentality, which is essentially, you know, the leader, the kind of the leadership style of bin Laden um, was such that he, he felt like he, he had the answers. And yet it, what was clear, I mean, as you point out from the Arab Spring, um, any message that he would have sent out into the world, uh, whether it was kind of like the, you know, Al Qaeda rebranded or, you know, in a sort of softer form or something, you know, uh, more grand, as you describe, sort of a council, world council of uh, religious elders would have fallen very much on deaf ears um, in large part, because as you say, I mean, he had undercut his credibility and the credibility of Al Qaeda um, through the continual, you know, uh, targeting of civilians um, of, of all kinds. And, and I think in some ways also lost, um, lost the plot on some level uh, in large part because of that commitment to targeting uh, Muslim civilians in particular. But also, you know, as I think Louise Richardson points out in her review of your book, which I thought was an excellent point, um, you know, he just didn't have a positivist vision ever. Um, he, he didn't really, he had a lot of ideas about how to topple regimes, how to take down um, governments, how to, you know, address these kind of injustices and grievances but no positivist vision. And I think, you know, um, I have to say he shares that in some ways and Al Qaeda shares that in some ways with the Taliban. Um, and I, you know, some might argue otherwise. Uh, I think we get into a very hearty debate. I'll, I'm sure we're gonna hear from the audience about that. Um, but the Taliban have always been split, um, I think in the rank and file and even in the middle level of leadership about what the vision for um, governance actually looks like in the longer term. Yeah, yeah. I could not agree with you more. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think that is, I mean, I think this is quite a profound point about the Taliban and we'll get to Al-Qaeda in a second, but the Taliban don't have a program for governance. I mean, I, uh, have, I spent a fair amount of time in Taliban controlled Afghanistan, which is why I've always had a healthy skepticism about their plans for the kind of um, utopia, uh, because this was a place that was, you know, the World Bank stopped measuring um, Afghanistan's economic indicators under the Taliban because there were none. 
the population of Kabul was 500,000 and it was like a ghost city. Now we don't know how large the population is, but four or five million, no one really knows. But um, so the Taliban, as far, I'm not an expert on the Taliban, I don't claim to be, but I, my, my view is, is that they believe that if we create a pure society where everybody is sort of worshiping God and living under Sharia law in our understanding of Sharia law, which obviously isn't how, how a lot of Muslims would see it, that um, the world will be made pure and you know you don't really need to govern. <laughs> so that, I think that's the Taliban program. And I, I think the, your point of, um, I, I, uh, Louise Richardson's, I think I said very interesting point, which is, you know, we know what bin Laden's against, what's he really for? I mean, again, the, the list of people that, Tal that Al Qaeda is against is the United States, Israel, Muslims that don't agree precisely with my point of view, every government in the Middle East, India, Pakistan, you know, the list goes on, uh, the list goes on and on. So um, I, I think that's true. And, uh, you know, the, if you look at the, you know, I refer to this in the book, I mean, David Rappaport is a uh, American uh, political scientist who, you know, came out with, he, you know, essentially he said there were four waves of terrorism, the anarchist wave, uh, the anti-colonial wave, the Marxist wave, and now the religious wave. And I think that's all true. No one can d debate it. Most of these things didn't succeed. The anarchist wave, by definition, they didn't have any ideas. <laughs> and it collapsed of its own lack of ideaness, as it were. Even though they killed President McKinley, they blew up the largest bomb in New York City in, in history on, uh, and, uh, with the terrorist attack that was, uh, for many years, the most lethal attack. In, in, uh, it happened, I think, in 1930 on Wall Street. And then the anti-colonial wave did succeed. I mean, Bruce Hoffman, you know, the Dean of Terrorism Studies in the United States has written a brilliant book about how Israeli terrorists, or let's say Zionist terrorists, you know, essentially pushed the British out of Palestine. By, and, and that program of terrorism succeeded. The Marxist wave collapsed with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and now we're in the religious wave, which I think has got a has got a lot of life in it. And I think on 9/11, the 20th anniversary, the split screen, the Taliban will want the world to see is them riding into certain Afghan cities on American military equipment that they've seized. And that will be their way of memorializing the 9/11 the attacks. And unfortunately, you know, I think that we, the Biden administration, has made a, in my view, a, a terrible unforced error in simply just sort of. Turn it, turning off the American involvement in Afghanistan. Um, and you know, we can speculate how it will all play out, but we've seen this movie before in Iraq after we left, the United States left in December of 2011. Uh, we went back in uh, three years later. Um, and what, we made the same mistake in Afghanistan. As Candace knows, we closed our embassy in 1989. That was a very, um, it turned out to be an expensive era. You know, we were, we were blind in Afghanistan to the, the civil war that followed the pull out of the Soviets, the rise of the Taliban, Al Qaeda, with, without an embassy, and and you know we may face that same problem again because if the if Kabul airport can't be defended, uh, every embassy is going to start. They've already yeah the Australian embassy is already closing or closed. Uh, you know people are going to start pulling out, um, and we we closed our embassy in Sudan in 1995. That also was a mistake, um, I think, because Bin Laden, of course, was based there for so long. And I think we lost the ability to get some pretty useful information from the Sudanese about Al Qaeda uh, because we were no longer there. Yeah, I mean, you know, I might quibble with you a little bit about the anarchist movement and its history and its successes in the context of Russia. Um, you know, they're famously um, really kind of fired the revolution in St. Petersburg, but again, that's a small footnote and quibble. Um, I, I do think uh, that you are right that the religious um, wave uh, as described by Rappaport is, is not yet over. And I think one interesting observation is um, what has risen in the last 20 years to counter that is a extremely, um, I think, virulent and relatively nascent uh, Christian nationalism that has um, risen to, to respond on some level uh, to this idea of a caliphate. Uh, you've seen a lot of that on, online and so forth and so on. And I think um, in some ways there's kind of a force and counterforce uh, still making this wave very active. But let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the other observations in the book, if, if we can. 
Um, I mean, some of the things that I think are also super interesting um, are just, you know, all the missed signs and messages and clues uh, as to where bin Laden was, um, you know, what his intentions were. Uh, and of course, we, you know, many of us probably who are, you know, listening in, talking uh, to this talk today uh, might have seen the movie Zero Dark Thirty. And there's a lot of myths that came out of that movie, um, which is, of course, documenting the, the raid on, on bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. Um, but of course, the central to that narrative uh, is this uh, Abu Ahmad al-Kuwaiti, uh, who was a longtime associate of bin Laden, a trusted agent of bin Laden. Uh, and information about him comes out pretty early, doesn't it, Peter? Yeah, and I mean, I stand corrected on the, on uh, Candace is a Russianist, so she knows Russian history a lot better than <laughs> almost anybody else. Uh, but um, so, um, you know, one, uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book is there are, there's a lot of new material. It's not just the about about documents. I mean, I think the Senate intelligence report on coercive interrogations and secret prisons was, it's a very dense report. We've only, we have the unclassified version is uh, 500 pages. It has, uh, I think, you know, 2000 plus footnotes, which are a goldmine for historians about, uh, because a lot of material surfaced there about in those footnotes about what was really happening, not just in the CIA interrogation program and secret prison, but also kind of the hunt for bin Laden. Um, and, um, you know, I think the, the report, um, let's leave me aside the debate on were co coercive interrogations uh, useful or not in finding bin Laden. I, I, in the book, I come down and say they, they really were not, particularly the CIA coercive interrogation program. In fact, the, the the five leading members of Al-Qaeda who had coercive interrogation techniques either supplied misleading information about bin Laden and his whereabouts or uh, <clears throat> no information at all. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the footnotes sort of describe, I think, an Agatha Christie story about how bin Laden was found. There was no magic detainee who sort of gave up the information. Bin Laden was pretty paranoid and very careful about his personal security. And after the arrest of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in 2003, the operational commander of 9-11, who, who Bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had met relatively recently before Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was, was, was captured. Uh, they met in SWAT, which is where one of the places that Bin Laden was hiding in Pakistan. Um, the, the, you know, the, from that point forward, Bin Laden was being super careful uh, and was meeting with no one outside of his immediate family and his two bodyguards. But, you know, we can piece together from the Senate Intelligence Committee report uh, and in particular uh, that the little fragments of information about the Kuwaiti, um, who was the bodyguard, started emerging as early as 2002. Now, you know, there was a lot of information coming into the CIA in 2002 about who was in Al Qaeda, their aliases, who their names might be. Al Kuwaiti was just one of hundreds of aliases of Al Qaeda members or associates that were sort of coming in. And his exact significance, I don't think, was begun until it wasn't until about 2007 that the agency really began focusing. And in fact, there was a very interesting memo from 2007 but that uh, was surfaced in the Senate Intelligence Committee report that came out, I think, in 2014. So this memo said essentially, we have, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of characterize the memo. So we don't have any leads on bin Laden. The only lead we now have, the only really live lead, is this guy Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti. We can, don't go and arrest him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we need to kind of, we, we don't know exactly where he is, but like he is as important as Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander of 9 11, was you know, until we arrested him in 2003. So so the, the, the report, and I, I won't get in too much in the weeds anymore on this because it, there was, was a lot to unpack here in a relatively short time, but the report, um, the intelligence, Senate Intelligence Committee report is a very good guide to the question of how uh, bin Laden was found. Suffice to say, the opening scene of Zero Dark Thirty where this guy is essentially tortured or coercively interrogated for the first hour, half hour of the film, and the burden, and, and the film suggests that without this, there would have been no, you know, Bin Laden capture, kill operation. I, I just think 
you know, the, the, the film is a film. The, the filmmakers try to have it both ways. They, they said it was based on actual events at the beginning of the film. And then when they were critiqued on the facts, they said, well, it's not a documentary. So um, the fact is, is that um, coercive interrogations by the CIA, I don't think were particularly useful. Uh, what was useful? Uh, liaison with foreign uh, intelligence services, uh, signals intelligence, human intelligence, spies on the ground, all the things that we kind of know uh, are part of the intelligence community kind of bag of, of uh, kind of tactics and techniques. Yeah, I mean, I think we can, I think we probably are in agreement that the co coercive techniques, um, in other words, torture, uh, you know, of Al Qaeda, uh, so-called high value targets, um, actually served as more of a political albatross around the neck of uh, successive administrations in the White House, uh, because it, it undercut, I think, the credibility of the effort uh, to, to seek out and decapitate uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, in a way that, you know, one would judge as, I think, in comportment with international law. Uh, it remains, you know, there are many still outstanding questions. Of course, the Inter International Criminal Court um, is still reviewing those cases. Uh, it has been a sticking point in the negotiations um, with Afghanistan's government, as well as the Taliban. Uh, you know, because of course the ICC has, you know, said that all parties are implicated in, you know, various war crimes uh, in, in the Afghanistan theater. So um, not exactly a plus, but I mean, you kind of raise um, the shadow of something that I have wondered about for years uh, that we should probably unpack. Um, it does not, I mean, I, I love this book, by the way, like I, I, you know, I've got it all marked up here. Peter doesn't believe me, but I, I really do have it marked up um, because I'm, you know, I'm a, a student of, of the movement. But one, one big puzzle piece that I think um, yet remains is the question of Ayman al-Zawahiri, who of course um, becomes kind of the, uh, you know, the manager, you know, the program manager for Al Qaeda in a way. Um, I think much to the chagrin of many others in the movement, uh, because he isn't a very charismatic guy. You know, he's an Egyptian scholar uh, and um, an Islamist and, and well trained, but not a very charismatic guy. But he's still out there somewhere. We think, right, Peter? So what what should we make of that? Well, he's, I don't think there's, I mean, some of us speculate he might be dead or he might be ill. I mean, we just don't know as a fact, as a factual matter. He certainly is sort of, he hasn't played, he's been a terrible leader of Al-Qaeda, let's put it that way. Um, he was unable to kind of paper over the differences between ISIS and Al-Qaeda, uh, which split in 2014. Um, you know, he hasn't, so he, he's been a terrible leader. If I was sort of running, um, you know, CIA operations, I'd leave him in place because He's run what remains of the group largely into the ground. He has not been an inspiration. There are other people in the wings who'd be much better. Saif al Adil, who's the military commander, uh, for instance. Um, but you know, it, one of the themes in the book is, and I, um, I wrote, I wrote my first book about Bin Laden. Uh, I finished it at ten about a, about a week before 9/11, and in that book, I exaggerated uh, the importance of Ayman al Zawahiri because, which was easy to do because. In all the when in the public statements Al Qaeda had made, for instance, they the one and only press conference in May of 1998, Sawahiri sitting next to Bin Laden as if he's sort of a really important person in Al Qaeda. But now I've looked at all the evidence. I mean, actually, Zawahiri was a very marginal player in Al Qaeda in the pre 9 11 era. Uh, he wasn't involved in the planning of any of the major anti-American attacks, the USS Cole in Yemen in 2000, the two US embassies attacks in Africa in 98 or 9-11. And, and that shouldn't be surprising because you know, <laughs> as a Russianist, you'll appreciate this, Candice, you know, for a good chunk of uh, 1997, Ayman al-Zawari was in a, in a jail in, in Dagestan. He had gone to try and support the Chechen war effort. Uh, he was arrested by the Russians and put in jail. They didn't know who they had. Who they had. In jail, he, he and two colleagues. Eventually, they went to trial. They kind of said they were businessmen who somehow got lost. And they were released. But when Bin Laden, you know, when Zawahiri returned, popped up in Afghanistan in 97, 98, he was somebody with virtually no followers. Uh, people I quote in the book who knew Bin Laden and Ayman al Zawahiri well, 
say he had either five followers, seven followers, or 10 followers. <laughs> you know, so pick your, pick your choice. And, you know, so this is Bin Laden has literally thousands of people that are going through his camps, 170 made members of Al Qaeda who swore, secretly sworn no for the legions and, you know, many thousands of people who kind of transit, you know, got trained in the camps without necessarily formally becoming part of Al Qaeda. And, uh, you know, Zawahiri was a supplicant in Bin Laden's world and he wasn't, and, and from a strategic point of view, the big strategic shift is something that Zawahiri had no role in, which is um, Bin Laden you know, said, hey, we should attack the United States uh, because then they'll pull out of the Middle East and what we want in the Middle East will then follow, which is Taliban style theocracies. Now, Bin Laden's theory of change was terrible and it backfired totally. 9-11 didn't work. It didn't produce regime change in the Middle East. It didn't get the Americans out. In fact, we've been more involved in the Middle East since 9-11 than at any point in American history with huge bases in Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, smaller bases in Djibouti, Syria. I mean, the list goes on and on. Of course, we launched a war in Afghanistan, a war in Iraq. Um, and none of this is something Bin Laden predicted. You know, he put a post facto gloss on what his failure is by saying in 2004, it's all a clever plot to bleed the Americans dry in forever wars. But that was not his plan at all before 9-11. And some people, you know, even smart people have sort of this going back to your myths question, kind of this is one of the big myths that you know this that 9-11 was a clever plot to embroil us in wars in the Middle East. No, quite the reverse. It was supposed to push us out of the Middle East. And so 9-11 was sort of a, a great tactical victory for Al-Qaeda, like Pearl Harbor was for Imperial Japan, but it was also a major strategic failure, uh, as Pearl Harbor was for, for Imperial Japan. Al-Qaeda didn't get what it wanted. Bin Laden died that knowing that none of his strategic goals had been achieved. And, you know, he, he died um, also knowing that his big goal of the time in the United States again had not happened. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, I mean, because it's sort of reflective of kind of this half-formed vision that he had of, you know, what would happen after toppling all these regimes. And, um, you know, as we, as we mentioned before, um, the proof would have been in the pudding, you know, during the Arab Spring in 2011, but it just... It never gelled, it never materialized, right? So um, it's an interesting point about kind of his legacy and how to interpret it, whether it was a tactical um, sort of bid or strategic one. And it turned out to be kind of a, a barely, a barely um, well-planned uh, tactical uh, journey on some level. So, um, well, with that, I mean, we've got, you know, about 15, 20 minutes here um, for, for questions from the audience. I know um, that there are a few out there, um, you know, we probably should start by um, talking a little bit about, um, you know, some of the legacies. But we have a question here from John Mueller. Uh, let me let me um, pose that to you. Which did the demise of Bin Laden hamper Al Qaeda Central uh, and its actions in any significant way? So, what was the impact of his actual death? John, thanks to John for the question. Of course, John has uh, been a very eloquent. Um, chronicler of the, of the war on terror and a, and a great skeptic of uh, American <laughs> actions during that war um, and overreactions, I think it's safe to say. Um, but yeah, I mean, so the question is, did, you know, did Bin Laden's death affect Al Qaeda? Is that basically the question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the short answer is yes, because Ayman al Zawahiri. look, I think it's very telling. It took six weeks for Al Qaeda to elect Zawahiri, who was, uh, you know, the anointed deputy uh, to become the top leader um, and Zawahiri is just, he's not an inspiration, you know, a, a, he's a black hole of charisma. Uh, you know, a lecture from Zawahiri is a guarantee to put you to sleep, uh, whether in Arabic or translated, you know, it's like, he just, he's just, he's an, he, he has not been a successful leader. He wasn't a great, he was, by the way, he was sort of disliked, uh, you know, one of the themes that you kind of see in the Zawahiri was, he was always kind of an annoying, uh, kind of, you know, irritating presence. Uh, no one, you know, he, and that was true long before he took over Al Qaeda. So unsurprising, he hasn't been uh, a particularly effective leader. Um, Al Qaeda was in bad shape when Bin Laden was killed uh, already. Um, you know, he, obviously it has ha had some successes with affiliates in Yemen, North Africa, in the Philippines and elsewhere. And those, those affiliates have kind of waxed and waned in importance. Al Qaeda in Iraq eventually, of course, became ISIS. Um, that, that's a form of success. Uh, ISIS continued to look at Bin Laden as the inspirational leader, even when they split off from Al Qaeda. Um, and he, but you know, his ideas linger on. I mean, I don't, you know, Bin Laden's ideas 
um, were not killed with his demise. But you know, overall, I mean, the fact that we haven't had a significant terrorist attack from a Al Qaeda or its affiliates in the, in the United States since 9-11 speaks for itself. The only one that has happened was that attack in 2019 in Pensacola, Florida, which had some links to Al Qaeda in Yemen. Three American sailors were killed. But you know, go back to 2002 and 2003 and the concerns there would be a second wave of attacks. And um, yeah, none of that happened. Uh, the United States has done a very good job of defending itself. It's done a very good job of it's offensive operations. Uh, you know, um, the best witness for that has been Laden. The Vatabat documents are just full of his concerns about the drone program, its effects on Al Qaeda. He was planning to move Al Qaeda into other parts of Pakistan, maybe back into Afghanistan. Um, and so, you know, it, it, we've managed this problem. I mean, the part of the, polit the political problem here, and this is John Muller, John would be sort of familiar with this, is you can't really declare victory because from a political point of view, if you declare victory and there's even a small terrorist attack that can somehow be traced back to Al Qaeda or one of its affiliates, you know, the political costs of that are very large. But the fact is that we as analysts and researchers can say, we have managed this, we, the United States and its allies have managed this problem pretty well. Uh, the last successful attack by Al Qaeda in the West was 15 years ago in London, July 7th, 2005. Um, you know, obviously you had ISIS with the attacks in 2015 in Paris that killed 130 people and Al-Qaeda and ISIS certainly have, you know, ISIS was a sort of a stepchild of Al-Qaeda. But the, the fact is, is that the United States and the South, I think, have done a pretty good job of managing this problem. Here we are 20 years after 9-11. Uh, we wouldn't have expected um, the kind of relative lack of successful terrorist attacks in the West um, by foreign terrorist organizations. Um, and so... I think yeah, it's not it's it's not over because as as Canada said, the, the religious wave is of terrorism is still with us. Uh, but and you can't just sort of ignore the problem and hope that we'll just sort of be buried in history's unmarked grave of discarded lies, which is George W. Bush's great uh, observation. I, I suspect that line was written by Michael Gerson, who's now a Washington Post columnist who's a speechwriter for, for, for George W. Bush, but it's a great line. Um, and I think, you know, Bin Laden is uh, heading into the kind of oblivion of, of the, that unmarked grave of discarded lies, but, uh, but not yet. No, by no means. I mean, you know, you point out something very interesting. I think that I, a lot of members of our audience will probably, you know, agree with on some level, um, you know, this idea of kind of clean victories in warfare um, I think, you know, we now can acknowledge just, uh, a mythos that disappeared uh, on 9-11, uh, maybe even before that, but I think 9-11 was most significant milestones um, because there was never going to be a clean victory, uh, say, this, you know, uh, this war and, uh, and it's, it's distinct. I think the, the threats um, have Shape, sort of transform their shape. And, you know, I, I think another important takeaway, of course, from, you know, what you've just said in your evaluation, and of course, the book, is that, uh, you know, the United States uh, is not one to take its lessons lightly, uh, even if it is slow to learn, uh, you know, what it means to secure the nation. Um, and it is, you know, endowed with certain capacities uh, to respond uh, when its vulnerabilities are exposed. Uh, unfortunately, it's not always, uh, you know, pretty uh, on the way to the response, but, um, you know, that capacity is there and that is what differentiates the United States from so many other um, comers in the world and, and rivals. Um, we have a question from Benjamin Tua. Um, where, does, uh, where does the Taliban get its money and weapons? And if Biden had pulled the remaining, hadn't, re had not removed the remaining troops and air support from Afghanistan, what would it take for the U.S. to uh, withdraw successfully? Well, uh, on the first, I mean, as you know, Candace knows far better than I because Candace lived in Afghanistan for many years covering this. Um, you know, I mean, there's a billion dollar, I, I don't know what the correct number is, but let's let's say it's a billion dollar heroin industry and for the, the Taliban is essentially, you know, they're, they're like, in some ways, like the FARC in Colombia, which is an insurgent movement that's funded by cocaine trade. Well, this is an insurgent movement 
funded by the opium and heroin trade, um, and they're able to pay their foot soldiers a not insignificant amount of money. You know, terrorism is usually carried out by volunteers and doesn't cost a lot of money. So, you know, Mohammed Atta, the lead hijacker on 9 11, he wasn't being paid. He did this because he believed. Um, and bin Laden, you know, these, you know, Ayman al Zawahiri, these are all volunteers. If you're running an insurgency like the Taliban or ISIS in Iraq and Syria, you've got a lot of people on the payroll, many of whom are just trying to make a living. Uh, they may believe in the cause, but they're also getting, you know, a not insignificant amount of money. So, drugs, I think, is the kind of answer with the Taliban, and I'm sure there's also extortion, taxation, and the like. Um, then, you know, what would a successful pullout from Afghanistan look like? I mean, I think, you know, um, we're still in South Korea 75 years after the end of the Korean War. There are more than 25,000 American troops there. Uh, they're there for a good reason. Uh, and under the, that American national security umbrella, South Korea went from a, probably the, one of the poorest countries in the world in 1953, the end of the Korean War, to now one of the richest. And South Korea, of course, is different from Afghanistan. But the point is, is that 20 years in the grand scheme of things is not, a, a, is, uh, some have portrayed our 20 year um, kind of involvement in Afghanistan as a long time. Well, you know, we're still in Japan, uh, we're still in Germany, we're still in South Korea. <clears throat> things, you know, a country like Afghanistan is not going to become a functional state um, quickly. Um, but we have certainly undermined it. And, you know, this is a bipartisan undermining. It began with President Obama with the West Point speech of December 1st, 2009, in which he announced a surge of troops and a withdrawal date. I was at CNN that day, and I remember, you know, CNN gets a copy of the speech before the speech is given. At three o'clock, the call on, on CNN was withdrawal, not surge and that was what that was the way it was interpreted in afghanistan by the taliban by the afghan government by the afghan people by pakistan and then we had the trump administration who said they're constantly going to withdraw and then we have president biden who said you know we are actually withdrawing so part of our problem i think has been just simply you know we keep saying we're going to well we, we keep changing our mind about what our strategy is there craig whitlock a former colleague of of canvas is going to coming out with a book around it's september 11th which um will be uh, actually edited by Priscilla Payton, who did a brilliant job of editing uh, the book that I uh, have just written. Uh, that book is based on Craig's uh, kind of um, really interesting series in the Washington Post about kind of how um, American leaders, you know, thought about the war and what they said publicly and what they said privately. The, the fact is we've had multiple different strategies. Uh, we said a lot of different things. Uh, we haven't been particularly coherent in terms of what our goals are, uh, but I do think that um, a, a complete withdrawal and saying we're completely withdrawing, we could have left one, one Marine outside the U.S. Embassy, and of course we're going to leave some, but we keep saying, you know, we, we're really withdrawing now, and it's not an accident the Taliban are, you know, they never had any intention of making peace uh, with either the United States or, or with the Afghan government. They just, they want to take over. Um, and they want to run Afghanistan, and they want to return it to what it was like before 9-11. That may be hard to do because there are a lot of well-armed Afghan militias. There's the Afghan National Army, not a particularly uh, successful group of uh, military, uh, but they do have a good, very good special forces capability. So I see the civil war in Afghanistan looking like the civil war in the 1990s, which I saw myself personally in 93. It was, you know, it makes the present Kind of conflict look like look like a croquet match uh, in terms of the scale of the conflict, the number of people who've kind of who died. Unfortunately, we could see a return to that. I, I think that's very likely. Well, it's so interesting that you mentioned the Afghanistan papers. Uh, of course, I con conducted a lot of those interviews um, that were, you know, kind of the, the center of, uh, of Craig's book uh, and his reporting for the Washington Post. And I, of course, talked to a lot of the folks that you're, you also talked to uh, from NATO, from the U.S. government, from, uh, you know, uh, European partners, Afghans. Um, and universally, that, you know, the, I think the big takeaway was that there was no strategy. Um, and, and there was no agreement on the strategy. And, and so there was a lot of kind of back and forth and waffling. Um, and I think to your, to your other point, Peter, which I think is um, you know, super interesting about sort of what, what will this new chapter potentially of the Afghan conflict look like uh, with the Taliban surging forward in you know, provincial capitals, um, you know, taking you know, large parts of territory. I think there will be one substantive di difference if I may sort of offer that uh, observation, which is, um, the Taliban in the 1990s were contending with radio and TV at best. 
uh, in terms of kind of the information environment. Uh, today, uh, they're contending with, you know, social media, um, iPhones, I mean, you know, cell phones, et cetera, et cetera. The, the whole kind of information environment has changed in Afghanistan as it has around the world. And I think it'll be very, very difficult for this uh, cadre of Taliban to really get their heads around that and control it in ways uh, that, you know, uh, sort of replicate, uh, for instance, other uh, authoritarian governments. You can think about uh, Egypt or Myanmar as, as good examples of where kind of control over information uh, can really shape, uh, you know, the, the stage of conflict. So um, just kind of a little, I think, you know, difference there that I think we're, we're going to watch unfold over time. I think we have time for a couple more questions. I want to get to those. Um, a good question, uh, I think, to, to ask is, of course, that we kind of know a little bit about, but I think it's worth unpacking. What was Osama bin Laden's relationship with Al Zarqawi? You talk about this in the book, but unpack it here for us. Well, Zarqawi was the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's well known that the relationship between Al Qaeda Central and Al Qaeda in Iraq was pretty tense. And in fact, <clears throat> there is a lot of material in the about about documents about how angry Al Qaeda leaders in Pakistan were about Iraq, you know, Al Qaeda in Iraq killing Christians and a sort of Iraqi Christians and attacking mosques and you know so I, I just think that the relationship was tense uh, and publicly you know they kind of glossed it over but privately there was a great deal of kind of animal real animosity I think between uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq and Al Qaeda Central but going back to something that the Canis said I, I think you're absolutely right one of the big differences in Afghanistan today is you have hundreds of new TV stations, new radio stations. You have a very young population. I think 70% of the population is under the age of 25. That, that's a whole group of people who don't have any great nostalgia for the Taliban. In fact, they weren't even born or very, very young when the Taliban were in power. And so I do think the Taliban, the Taliban certainly have you know, the guns, uh, the zeal, but they're gonna face Uzbek militias, Tajik militias, the Afghan National Army, a bunch of young people who just don't particularly want to be ruled by the Taliban. Um, and, you know, they, they may well take over the south and the east of the country. Um, and if they offer, you know, kind of a high degree of peace under a theocracy, that's um, something that a number of Afghans, particularly Pashtuns, will accept. Uh, but there will be a bunch of Afghans, who, uh, either because of their political views or because of their ethnic group, uh, who just will never accept uh, being ruled by the Taliban. And, you know, hopefully the Taliban might agree to some kind of coalition government, um, but I doubt it. Yeah, right. I mean, I think uh, a small factoid that a lot of people probably don't know, you know, um, you know, Afghan is uh, kind of a, a Pashto word for loud, <laughs> um, an, an actual fact. Um, and, and many, many Afghans, uh, nationals, um, do not refer to themselves as Afghans in Dari. Uh, there's another word for that, um, simply because they don't like to be associated with this kind of uh, Pashtun, uh, you know, sort of tribal law uh, framing of, of citizenship. And I think you're, you're going to see, um, even though it will be tough and that a lot of lives will be lost, uh, there's going to be a lot of resistance. And I, I think um, the, the Taliban have their work cut out for them if they're not thinking about um, developing some sort of coalition power sharing agreement with the current Afghan government. Um, we have time for probably one or two more last questions here. I want to get to this one from our colleague Hassan Abbas, who of course is one of the preeminent scholars on all things um, insurgency in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, he has been around a long time. And, and Hassan asks, um, Peter, is there anything that you learned from the Abbottabad documents that surprised you uh, in regards to bin Laden's local network in Pakistan or the broader region? Well, Hassan, who's a former New America fellow, who's a very distinguished scholar of uh, Islam, Shia Islam, and, and wrote a great book about Pakistan and the nuclear weapon program, and amongst many other books. So Hassan, I mean, I think um, you know, one thing that I, it's hard to prove negatives, but there's nothing in the documents uh, that to show that bin Laden was in touch with Pakistani officials, that Pakistani officials knew where he was. You know, there's a whole kind of conspiracy theory about this. I mean, some for, Senator Carl Levin, who unfortunately just recently died, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Armed Services Committee at the time, Bin Laden was killed, said that he believed that senior Pakistani officials were protecting Bin Laden. 
Um, and that seemed you know, like, you know, you know, the fact that he was found not far from Pakistan's equivalent of West Point sort of certainly made people suspicious. But there's nothing in the documents that show that bin Laden had some sort of Pakistani officer who was his minder. Nothing to substantiate Cy Hirsch's crazy conspiracy theories about the United States and Pakistan kind of both knowing where bin Laden was and that he was being kind of protected by the Pakistanis and funded by the Saudis and the, the whole Na US Navy SEAL operation was kind of like the fake moon landing. And there's just nothing, there's nothing in there to substantiate any of that. And bin Laden, you know, mentioned the 6,000 pages of documents. Uh, they were never intended to be, uh, he never thought they would land in enemy hands. Uh, and they portray uh, Al Qaeda as, you know, basically, you know, the very, very der derogatory comments about Pakistan that referring to the Pakistani uh, Pakistani government uh, as apostates, which is the gravest charge you can you can make about a fellow Muslim. Uh, plans for military operations against Pakistan are in those documents. There was an attempt to um, have a truce between Al Qaeda and the Pakistani government. Uh, feelers were put out to the Pakistani Taliban, which have links to the Pakistani government, to try and negotiate a truce. In the end, nothing happened. Uh, the, it was just talk, uh, as one of the documents uh, uh, outlines. So, I mean, uh, you know, it, it, so you know, the documents just don't substantiate anything that uh, that there was any kind of Pakistani collusion knowledge about Bin Laden's presence in Afghanistan. What was my, you know, I think the big surprise. My big, biggest surprise in all this was the extent to which Bin Laden's two educated wives, all his older wives, were really helping him think through his strategic thinking. Uh, because you don't, that's, I mean, I, to me, that was an, a very interesting, um, uh, that, you know, we, we, there's quite a lot of proof of this now. I think we kind of knew that uh, uh, several years ago, we knew that Bin Laden's two older wives were highly educated. Uh, but I don't think we knew the extent to which they influenced his thinking, that they were his intellectual sounding boards. Absolutely. The family, the family um, angle uh, is just one of the most fascinating parts of the book. Um, we are almost at time here. And so I want to, first of all, uh, once again, commend the book. <laughs> Congratulate you, Peter. Um, go out, get your copy, guys. Um, it's an excellent read. Um, you can dog ear it like me or, you know, do whatever. Uh, and I also want to thank Solid State again for helping us um, organize this event and, uh, of course, uh, working with Peter to publish um, what is, I think, an excellent account uh, on the anniversary of 9-11 of the rise and fall of Osama bin Laden. Thank you all for joining us and um, tune in again for our next conversation with Peter. Thank you, Candace. Thanks for doing this.